Hello everyone, my name is Barry Lacey and I'm the Historian in Residence with Wexford County Council's Library and Archive Service as part of their Decade of Centenaries. And today I'm going to be bringing you a talk entitled The Battle for Enniscorthy and the Outbreak of Civil War in County Wexford. During this talk, we'll be looking at the first instance of fighting which broke out in the county as part of the Civil War in Enniscorthy on the 2nd of July 1922, as well as fighting that broke out three days later on the 5th of July in Ferns Village. We'll be exploring the background to these events, the fighting itself, and the aftermath that it left on the County Wexford. So I hope you enjoy this talk. Following the ratification of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in January 1922, divisions were occurring in the Republican movement over differences in opinion regarding the treaty. In March 1922, anti-treaty IRA officers held an army convention in Dublin that would later result in the election and establishment of an executive council which was opposed to the treaty. The IRA was divided, with those who supported the treaty termed pro-treaty and aligning themselves with the National Army of the New Irish Free State, while those who opposed it were termed anti-treaty and pledged their loyalty to the new executive elected at the convention. On the 28th of June 1922 then, the civil war in Ireland commenced with the bombardment by Free State forces of the four courts in Dublin, then occupied by anti-treaty IRA forces. After several days of fighting, Dublin city was left in a ruinous state, with many wounded, including civilians. To gain an understanding of the situation in County Wexford at the outbreak of the Civil War, we can look at the witness statement of Francis Carty, who was an officer in the South Wexford Brigade IRA. He describes how there were only two military posts in the county under the control of Free State forces, being at Inniscorthy and Ferns, and it was decided that the anti-treaty forces should occupy both. However, there was a reluctance to avoid any casualties among former comrades, and this is evident with Carty stating how the anti-treaty commander, Paddy Fleming, and I quote, was anxious that there should be no unnecessary bloodshed. In an attempt to avoid such a scenario then, contact was made with Sean Gallagher, who was the officer commanding of the Free State Forces in Inniscorthy, to surrender. Now, despite his refusal to do so, the reluctance to avoid bloodshed is further evident in the tactics with they, which they, the anti-treaty forces, adopted in response, where instead of a full-on frontal assault of the town, they planned to cut off the water supply to free state positions, which when combined with sniping, it was hoped would lead to an eventual surrender. After becoming aware of the outbreak of fighting in Dublin, both sides in County Wexford must have known it was only a matter of time before similar was to reach the county, and so began making preparations. On Friday afternoon, the 30th of July, Free State troops in Inniscorthy Town, who had been stationed in the former RIC barracks, under the command of Staff Captain Gallagher, began occupying and fortifying the castle, then lived in by the Roach family. The remaining 26 troops in the barracks were then left under the command of Brigadier Nicholas J. Murphy. In response to this, the following afternoon, anti-treaty forces, who had occupied the town's courthouse since April, took control of St. Mary's Church, which they proceeded to fortify. Armed men were positioned in the tower, which provided an excellent vantage point over the entire town. This occupation did not go unnoticed, however, as local priest Reverend James Rossiter protested and intervened, resulting in the troops having to leave the church that night to allow for Sunday morning service to be held the next day, after which the church was reoccupied once again. Similar activity continued throughout the weekend. On Saturday evening, anti-treaty reinforcements were reported to have poured into the town, some of which were billeted in Mr Bennett's hotel on Temple Shannon and armed guards placed off at the door. On Sunday evening, anti-treaty forces commandeered and occupied additional positions within the town, including that belonging to a Mr. Morrissey and Mr. J. Neal, both on John Street. They also occupied the Technical Institute on Market Square and a house on the corner of Court Street and Friary Hill belonging to a Mr. Whitney. In response to these activities, Free State troops occupied the stores of Mr. George Letts Brewery on Mill Park Road, which overlooked the rear of the courthouse, the anti-treaty forces headquarters in the town. Firing in Inniscorthy broke out on Sunday night, the 2nd of July at approximately 10.30pm. According to a report from the Echo newspaper, an anti-treaty messenger from the courthouse 
arrived with a message calling on the Free State garrison to surrender, or they shall be treated as enemies. The message was from Divisional Commandant Fleming, HQ 3rd Battalion, Eastern Division. They also reported the castle and barracks were mined and they had to switch. It was stated they required an immediate reply. The message read, To the OC Beggars Bush forces in Escorty, Unless you immediately signify your willingness to uphold the Republic against any other government or pretend government in Ireland, I shall consider you an armed enemy of the Republic and hence treat you as duty demands. Signed, Podrick Fleming, OC Third Eastern. P.S. In the interests of saving life, where possible, I inform you that the castle and barrack are mined and we hold the switch. The anti-treaty messenger informed the Free State garrison that an immediate reply was required, and Nicholas J. Murphy replied he would do so and ordered his adjutant to type the following. It wrote, To Commandant Fleming, Your communications received. I and my forces stand by Dal Ern. We shall uphold the honour of the nation and defend our position with our lives. Signed, Nicholas J. Murphy, Vice Brigadier, North Wexford. The Echo newspaper reported that Nicholas, Nicholas Murphy was about to sign the reply when gunfire on the barracks commenced. Ordinary citizens were caught out in the conflict by surprise and, and in the crossfire and panic in which ensued, many sought shelter where they could in strangers' homes and businesses. Between 10.30 and 12 that night, the firing was described as heavy and almost continuous with anti-treaty snipers positioned along the turned rocks and fields adjoining the Mercy Convent concentrating their fire on the castle and barrack. In reply, Free State forces concentrated their fire on St Mary's Church and the courthouse. Rifle and machine gun fire could be heard throughout the town, with many people unable to return to their homes until the following morning. No casualties and little damage to property was reported from the fighting on Sunday. Early Monday morning, the situation in the town had calmed, with only occasional firing reported. Many people who had been held up in strangers' homes and businesses used the opportunity to return to their own homes. Others rushed to gather supplies from local shops in anticipation of further conflict, with many businesses, including banks, closing around noon. At around 11 o'clock that morning, firing broke out again for approximately 15 minutes. For many residents, the conflict was too much and they decided to leave the town and seek shelter in the countryside. People were reported walking along the roads out of the town, some with children. By that afternoon, it was reported Lower Church Street, Friary Hill, Friary Place, Castle Hill and Castle Street were practically deserted of their occupants. In the midst of the conflict, though some aspects of life carried on. At 3 p.m. On, on, on Monday morning, a man named Curran from Friary Hill, who had been sick for some time, died and later on his coffin was carried to the cathedral. Outbursts of fire occurred again later that night, with explosions heard near the castle, which broke windows in nearby houses. While there were no casualties as of yet, four anti-treaty troops positioned in the church, St. Mary's Church, were reported to have been wounded during the fighting on Monday night. The steeple of St. Mary's Church, although seeming like a good position, seems to have been otherwise. The Echo newspaper reported how one man described it as a hell in a box because of the machine gun fire from the castle. While steel plates and sandbags were placed along the lower grating, bullets entered the, through the unprotected upper portion and ricocheted off the wall, injuring some of the men inside. Wool placed along the wall helped alleviate the problem slightly. The constant fire from the castle made it a difficult sniping position. A civilian casualty on the day was a man named Edward Dillon from the Shannon area of the town. He had been travelling up Temple Shannon and was hit by a ricochet bullet and wounded in the lake. On Monday, the Free State troops had also abandoned their position in Letch Brewery and returned to the barracks. There was no sign of the conflict ending on Tuesday as fierce fighting continued in the town. The firing was so intense it was dangerous to cross the bridge with many people remaining indoors. At around 3 p.m. loud explosions were heard coming from the vicinity of Slaney Street. It was reported that anti-treaty snipers had taken up position in the properties along Slaney Street to attack the castle from the rear. In response, Free State soldiers threw bombs in an attempt to dislodge their attackers. 
Further heavy firing occurred here between 5 and 6 p.m. that evening, with anti-treaty forces occupying Roach's stores on Island Road, targeting the castle. The fighting continued into Tuesday night and Wednesday morning with the sound of rifle, machine gun and explosions, a regular occurrence. Early Wednesday morning, a large number of anti-treaty forces entered the town. This included a group from Tipperary commanded by Michael Sheehan, as well as Ernie O'Malley, Sean Lamass and Paddy O'Brien, the latter three having escaped from the four courts in Dublin. This outside influence led to an uptake in hostilities, and men took up positions in stores opposite the barrack in Abbey Square, which they fortified with sandbags, while anti-treaty forces encircled free state positions. The first casualties in the conflict took place on Wednesday morning. At about 5am, a group of anti-treaty troops positioned themselves along Friary Place at the rear of the post office, which they thought was occupied by Free State forces. Among the group was Ernie O'Malley, Sean Lamass, Paddy O'Brien, Francis Carty and Morris Bellan, the latter being from Hospital Lane in the town. In his book, The Singing Flame, Ernie O'Malley describes how himself and others rushed up Friary Place to the rear of the post office, where they smashed a window and threw in grenades. Suddenly one of the group, Morris Bellan, was shot and fell wounded. A few more shots and Paddy O'Brien was also wounded. O'Malley returned fire with his revolver. Francis Carty described the situation in his witness statement. He stated, we did not know at the time that Sean Gallagher and some of the Free State officers in the castle had made their way out and were now in occupation of a house a short distance from the castle and overlooking the lane we were coming along. As we reached the corner of the lane, they opened fire on us. Spillan was attended to by doctors Murphy and Boyce, but was beyond help. According to his pension file, he worked as a shoemaker in the town and had previously been active during the War of Independence. Patrick O'Brien was a native of Inchicore, and he had been shot through the lung and would later die in the county home in Inniscorty on Tuesday afternoon, the 11th of July, at just 24 years of age. After his death, his remains were brought to the cathedral that same evening and were saluted by Free State soldiers passing through the market square and on to the cathedral's mortuary, mortuary chapel. The remains were later transferred to Dublin via train that night. Recalling the loss of his comrade, Early O'Malley, writing years later, described how after the initial surrender of Free State forces in the town, himself and Sean Lamass visited O'Brien while he was being cared for in hospital. There they found that he was beyond medical help and was slowly dying. After saying their heartfelt goodbyes, they left, and O'Malley remarked that the capture of this place was never worth his loss. Sean Lamash replied, No, I wish we had never come near this damn place. On Wednesday, fierce fighting continued in Enniscorthy, with anti-treaty force concentrating their fire on the RIC barracks. Meanwhile, Free State forces, attempting to mount an offensive, at 11 that morning, occupied houses on Slaney Place. Anti-treaty forces sandbagged Friary Place and occupied stores along the south end of the quay and concentrated their fire on the barracks. People avoided the bridge and area around Castle Hill, and anyone wanting to cross the River Slaney was forced to do so at Black Stoops by boat. Free State soldiers were now in an increasingly dire position, as communications between the castle and the barracks had been cut off. The Echo newspaper reported how one of the Free State soldiers positioned in the barracks, Brigadier Murphy, would later describe the firing on the building as, and I quote, a hurricane of lead. The machine gun bullets regularly whizzed through the loopholes and their concentrated fire shook the steel shutters. Ernie O'Malley, in describing the conflict, wrote that it was decided to use explosives to gain entry into the castle and set fire to the building. Fortunately, though, a delegation of priests approached him in an attempt to avoid any further conflict, and subsequently the clergymen spoke with the castle's garrison and a surrender was agreed. Then, at around 4.15pm on Wednesday evening, the 5th of July 1922, 
free state forces in the Castellan barracks surrendered to the anti-treaty forces, with a white flag displayed from one of the barrack windows. That evening, free state troops were allowed to keep their uniforms, personal belongings and return home while all weapons and ammunition was to be given to the anti-treaty forces. In a show of respect, anti-treaty officers returned revolvers to their free state counterparts. According to O'Malley, this was done on the basis that they would promise not to take up arms against the Republic again. As the Free State troops left the castle and barracks, they shook hands with their anti-treaty counterparts, both acknowledging each other's courage. The four-day conflict in Enniscorthy resulted in two deaths and multiple casualties on both sides. These are displayed here on the screen. On the anti-treaty side, there was two deaths, Morris Villan and Patrick O'Brien while those wounded were named as Thomas Roach, Michael Kirwan and Andrew Redmond. On the Free State side, those wounded were named as Brigadier Nicholas J. Murphy, John Power, Sean Gallagher and a P. Cavanagh. On Wednesday night after the fighting, a great number of anti-treaty troops billeted in the town's hotels, pubs and also in the technical schools. On Thursday, only a few businesses opened in the town, still weary of what had occurred. As Ferns Village was the second location within the county with a Free State garrison, it too was exposed to conflict. On Friday the 30th of June, Free State troops in Ferns occupied and fortified the post office in the village, opposite the RIC barracks. That Sunday, a Free State garrison was also placed in the surviving tower of the Norman Castle, where they mounted a machine gun. This position provided a commanding view over the village and surrounding area. Later that Sunday night slash Monday morning, anti-treaty IRA began to arrive into the village, allegedly drawn from nearby companies at Gorey, Cranford, Bridewell, Carnew, Ballandagan, Bonclody and Enniscorthy, the latter of which already contained a large force of anti-treaty troops. In response, Free State troops began occupying additional positions within the village, including the houses and business premises of Mr. David Bulger and Mr. James Dunn on the square. Elsewhere, anti-treaty forces also occupied the premises of Mr. J.J. Houghton and Mr. P.C. Lett, Kilogi Castle, owned by the Reinhardt family, the grounds of the cathedral, St. Aidan's Demence, and grounds adjacent to the deanery. Similar to in Escorti, civilians in fear of their lives began to leave Ferns. Newspaper accounts reported how many of the residents at the lower end of the village left their homes in fear of what was to come. This allegedly included an individual named Lawler, a man who had been confined to his bed for the previous nine years. Support for Free State troops in the town was also evident as many of the men within the village began felling trees to block roads in an attempt to slow the arrival of further anti-treaty reinforcements. In an unexpected change of events, anti-treaty forces left Ferns peacefully in the early hours of Tuesday morning the 4th of July. However, their departure was short-lived, with a force of anti-treaty troops returning during Tuesday night slash Wednesday morning and reoccupying their former positions in the village, in addition to the village's Catholic church, where snipers were placed in the belfry, providing a commanding view similar to that of the castle. A free state officer from Dublin arrived in the village on Tuesday night, bringing supplies of arms and ammunition, most likely having made use of anti-treaty forces' temporary absence. At approximately 5 a.m. on Wednesday, the 5th of July, 1922, fighting broke out with anti-treaty forces firing on free state positions in the village. They responded with their own fire and the civil war had reached Ferns. At approximately 8 a.m., just three hours after the firing began, the first casualty of the conflict occurred, when Matthew Pender, one of the free state troops positioned in the castle, was shot near the heart. The village's Catholic priest, Reverend M. Kinsella, who was only just recently, recently ordained and doing temporary replacement duty, was wounded attending the stricken soldier. A brief truce was agreed to allow the removal of both wounded, and during this, many of the village's inhabitants, who hadn't already left, took the opportunity to leave, many seeking shelter in the countryside. Matthew Pender was later attended to by the village's doctor, before he was taken to Inniscorthy 
but unfortunately would die of his wounds on Friday the 7th of July. The fighting continued unabated in Farns throughout Wednesday. Already having lost one comrade to the conflict, the Free State Forces position was further diminished by the arrival of additional anti-treaty forces, armed with machine guns and rifle grenades. At the same time, the conflict was raging in the Scorti, where the arrival of anti-treaty forces had intensified the conflict. After the eventual surrender of Free State Forces in Inniscorti town, Brigade Staff Officer Nicholas J. Murphy, accompanied by Reverend Father Cummins, arrived in Ferns that Wednesday night and advised Free State Forces in the village to surrender. They were given one hour to consider the proposition by the anti-treaty forces commander, and after consideration and being outnumbered, they surrendered. And the arms and ammunition were given over and the men were allowed to go free. Anti-treaty forces in Ferns made an unsuccessful attempt to set fire to the former RIC barracks, later choosing to sabotage it instead. The one casualty from the fighting in Ferns, Matthew Pender, was laid to rest in St Aidan Cemetery on Sunday the 9th of July with full military honours. His funeral cortege was a mile in length and described as the largest in living memory. Local clergy headed a procession followed by a firing party with reverse arms accompanying the hearse, followed by relatives and then members of the Ferns IRA garrison. His last words were alleged to have been, keep on fighting. Newspaper reports stated he was just married 10 months and owing to the outbreak of civil war, word of his wounds or death did not reach his widow before the funeral. According to Pender's pension file, he had been living in a tie at the time of his death but was originally from Milltown and Ferns. The Echo newspaper reported he was just 29 years old at the time of his death. After the surrender on Wednesday the 5th of July of Free State troops in Inniscorti town, anti-treaty forces occupied the castle. On Thursday there was very little business in Inniscorti, with only a few shops opening, as much normal business had ceased. Some people who had previously left the town to seek shelter during the initial battle returned, However, rumours of free state forces advancing south, coupled with the fear of further conflict, meant many of those who had returned left again. On Friday the 7th of July, Ferns village was to be retaken by free state troops advancing south from Gorey. In an attempt to slow their advance, a road bridge at Broadford, just a mile from Ferns, was demolished by anti-treaty forces the night before. Newspaper reports stated that it took an hour to get the free state convoy across the damaged bridge. Francis Carty, in his witness statement, described how upon returning to Ferns after blowing up that very bridge, the lorry in which he was travelling broke down, and himself along with others waited in the post office while more men sought alternative transport. Newspaper reports described the total of 39 IRA men stationed in the post office, the RIC barracks in the village having been sabotaged after anti-treaty forces made an unsuccessful attempt to burn it. Four of these were outside on guard duty, while others were sent across the village in search of alternative transport. Suddenly the post office garrison was caught off guard when a Free State armoured car pulled up outside. They asked the anti-treaty forces to surrender and this was met with shots from the post office's two end windows. The armoured car's machine gun fired back injuring the four sentries outside and aiming at the end windows. The garrison inside then surrendered and making the incident a quick affair. Carty again recalling the incident stated that the convoy that recaptured the village consisted of several hundred men with four or five armoured cars and one or two field guns. One of the armoured cars was marked a custom house while they all had official IRA written on them. Also one man named Murphy was seriously injured when a bullet hit him whereas he was looking for an alternative escape at the rear of the post office. After the firefight, a number of people quickly attended the scene to provide help to the wounded. The men that were wounded were then later transferred to Dublin for treatment, accompanied by local nurses. The Free State Convoy was very much welcomed into the town, with local man Miles Breen, who had fought in Dublin, being among them receiving an ovation. Arrests were made in the village, including the alleged leader of the anti-treaty garrison, Joseph Killeen who had been staying in a house in Ferns with a subordinate, Michael Barnes. Over 30 prisoners were taken and temporarily held in the National School. These were later transported to an escorty. 
Among the items retrieved, that retrieved by Free State forces after fighting at Ferns was a large landmine, as well as numerous rifles and ammunition. On Monday, telephone and telegraph wires between Ferns and Dublin were restored, and the post office handed back. During their stay or occupation of Ferns, anti-treaty forces took many goods, with £25 being taken from Houghton's store in the village worth of goods, including jumpers and silk stockings. At around noon on Friday the 7th of July, it was reported that a dispatch rider arrived into the town with news that Free State forces had retaken Ferns and were proceeding south towards an escorted town. Panic ensued with civilians running for cover while armed men took up positions. Lorries and motor cars sped in every direction, all in preparation for another conflict. Civilians also began to leave the town for safety in the countryside. In all this commotion, a bag of sugar burst at the gay courthouse gate and attracted the attention of the local children. A reporter from the Free Press newspaper described the situation as follows. There was a general rush from business and private houses, and the only sight that met one's gaze was the procession of the men, women and children burdened with parcels along the roads in the direction of the country. The spectacle was a sad one and must remain engraved Infaceably on the minds of all who were either participants or witnesses of it. To avoid any further conflict, it appears that the anti treaty forces decided to abandon in the Scarty. Before their departure, however, they set fire to the courthouse, which was later completely gutted. The barracks was also made uninhabitable and was described as being in a dilapidated appearance, with slates missing from the roof. Ernie O'Malley, in writing, describes how, how the barracks was saved from total destruction only because of the intervention of clergy, who asked him to spare it along with the castle. He also stated that an inspection of the castle showed it was a mess, with a water tank having been ruptured by bullet holes, and water flowed out the front door. The roof of the police barracks was smashed and the steel plates taken away to discourage its reoccupation. On Friday evening, the 7th of July, following the departure of much of the anti-treaty forces in Inniscorty, two Free State single turned armoured cars with revolving machine guns entered the town via Nunnery Road. Temporarily halting near the presentation centre, the sight of the ve vehicles caused a few remaining anti-treaty IRA patrolling near the Duffery to seek shelter in homes, while others fled towards the country. The cars proceeded along Pig Market Hill, down Wafer Street and into the Market Square, stopping outside the Technical Institute, which it was believed contained anti-treaty forces. Here they separated, with one heading by the castle, while the other went along Rafter Street, Court Street and John Street, down Lemington Road, now a parallel road, along Mill Park Road and onto Slaney Place, where they both rejoined and left the town via Island Road. Then, just before four o'clock, Free State troops and convoy entered in Escorty via Nunnery Road, now Convent Road. They went down Wafer Street and into the Market Square, where they were met with cheers from the public. The convoy consisted of two armoured cars, five armour plated cars, four large lorries and a field gun. Suddenly, in the midst of the cheering, a shot rang out when one of the Free State troops, Daniel McNamara from Dublin, accidentally discharged a shot from his rifle injuring himself in the foot. Thinking it to be anti-treaty fire, the convoy concentrated their machine guns and rifles on the Technical Institute. After the firing ceased, however, troops proceeded to the castle, where the large gun was aimed. The building was found empty, and prisoners from Ferns were then placed inside. The armoured cars and search parties roamed around the town and found it very much empty. The exception to this was two anti-treaty soldiers who were found in the licensed premises rafters at the bridge and were taken prisoner. Meanwhile, Captain Sean Gallagher, who had been resting his wounds, was brought back to the town and made commander of the newly established castle garrison. In the aftermath of the conflict in the Scorty, multiple compensation claims were lodged, which gives an idea of some of the damage that was sustained from the fighting. These can be seen here on the screen and include one by Mr. Michael White of Castle Hill, who claimed £300 for damages to his premises, including window and window sashes being blown out, the roof and tiles struck with bullets, 
rifle grenades, a partition blown down, doors broken, furniture and staircase broken, mattresses torn apart by bullets, foodstuffs and groceries and clothing removed. The same person claimed damages for a dwelling house belonging to him in Court Street. Elsewhere, Mr John Ryan of Castle Hill claimed £30 worth of damages for his, to his premises, including two doors which were forced open, windows which were smashed by bullets and clothing which was taken away. The same amount was also claimed by the Church Institute and £50 worth of damage for the church steeple. And Mrs Winkinson of Castle Hill also claimed £50 worth of damage to her premises, while Mr Henry J Roach claimed £500 for damages to the castle, including bullet damage to the staircase, windows, ceilings and a carpet damaged by water flowing from the radiator, punctured by a bullet and also a stolen overcoat. In Ferns, £250 of a claim was lodged for the damage to the barracks by Mr Denby. Following on from the capture of an escorted by Free State forces, the towns of Bunclody, Wexford and New Ross would later be evacuated by anti-treaty forces and taken control, control of by the Free State. Although the provisional government managed to seize control of all urban areas within the county, the conflict was far from over and for the remainder of the year and into 1923 the civil war would continue within Wexford and elsewhere.